The animal kingdom usually seems pretty straightforward. The bigger animal eats the smaller animal. But there are some cases where the tables are turned and the little guys win. At first glance, the Apomus beetle might seem like an easy meal for a hungry frog. But not all is as it seems in this brutal episode of Life, Death, and Taxonomy. Welcome back to Life, Death, and Taxonomy. Your 30 minutes of interesting animal info. I'm Joe. And I am Carlos. And today we're talking about a come from behind victor. A true underbug story. Underbug was what I put in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> that's my first that's my first nickname, the underbug. <laughs> Alright. I also have the insidious insect and the Don Cheetle Beetle. Oh my god. Because it's a war machine. <laughs> <laughs> that's just- that's inspired. Is it, is it inspired? <laughs> that's perfect. That's but of perfection. course, of course, we're talking about the Epomus beetle. Of course, of that's course, what we're yeah. talking about. You knew, you knew as soon as we you saw the name of the podcast yep. episode. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I also I also referred to this as the xenomorph bug. It, it doesn't have quite a ring to it, but we'll explain later. Okay. Xenomorphs are neat. Mm-hmm. This They're, bug is neat. If you don't know what a xenomorph is. I'll explain later. <laughs> this isn't a bug. We'll get to that later. Oh, think, really? too. So it's not an underbug. And it no. Well, but it is an insidious a, insect. <laughs> it's a colloquial bug. Co- colloquial? It's a yeah. Colloquial bug. It's a colloquial. You're bug. You're white about that. I'm white. Yep. Not, yeah. but this beetle isn't. That's true. Well, T- tell us more about it. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm about to tell you the taxonomy. Is that cool? Yeah. You got anything else before we get into it? <laughs> no, <laughs> I've exhausted my list of fun names. So kingdom, and this may come as a surprise to some people. I'm not even kidding. I know we do this a lot, but it's the kingdom animalia. So I've heard on multiple occasions, people not thinking insects are animals. I'm like, they're like, no, they're not animals. They're insects. Oh, the in- insecta or whatever is a kingdom. Yeah. No. No, they're animals. Insects are animals. So yeah, it actually comes as a surprise to some people. Yeah. Phylum, Anthropoda, and we're getting closer. Arthropoda. That's what I said. I thought you said Anthropoda. Oh, no, Arthropoda. Okay. <laughs> um, I, thought, I thought that's what I said. We'll it's listen back. It's a little human bug. Um, <laughs> it's a little it's Spider-Man. Indian in the cupboard. <laughs> it's Spider-Man. It's a Thumbelina. <laughs> Anthropoda. Um, oh, some taxonomy humor. <laughs> Get that Latin. Um, it's in the class Insecta. There we go. Yeah. Starting to recognize these, these words. These words. I know some of these words. Um, The order is Cleopatra. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, Coleoptera. Colonoscopy. (laughs) Or Coleoptera. 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 That sounds right. Helicopter. Mm -hmm. Um, Family. Now here's where we it starts getting harder. Carabidae. Actually, that was easy. Carabidae. Yeah. Like a good Italian restaurant <laughs> or a mid-level Italian no, restaurant. No, it's a, a great emo acoustic rock singer, Chris Carabadia. What? That's the Dashboard Confessional. Is, is, is that what his name is? His name is Chris Caraba. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, don't know if singer, I don't know the lead singer from Dashboard Confessional well, off the top of my head. You don't have your finger on the pulse of 2005 culture. <laughs> <laughs> um, subfamily, we don't usually do this. But uh, it's an, it's it's important. Lysin in a lysin in a. Okay. Um, and then there's a tribe, which is a small family or a small group of thirty species, called. I. How do you Clay-ine-ne. spell that? Clayine ne. What? Clayine ne. It's got two eyes. It's got a C H L in succession. See, you wrote that down. I did not write the tribe and uh, subfamily down, so I can't help you with that. I can't visualize this word. It's too com- Klenei-ni. complicated. Klenei-ni. Yep. That's insane. That, that's about that's about what that's you got. Gr- that's gratuitously complicated. <laughs> yeah, that's someone just wanted to mess with everyone in the in the tribe. Yeah, in the taxonomical in the, breakdown in the in their Facebook group. The tribe Facebook. Tribe. <laughs> um, so this tribe is. A section of this family, or the subfamily, that lives in swamps and pond areas. Okay, cool. Um, 
And there's a couple different genuses. We we've, we've looked at a couple different ones. It seems. Um, I was looking at Epomus bonelli, and you were well. Looking there's at, one genus, and it's Epomus. You're right. There's one one genus. There's a couple different species. I meant to say. Right. My I uh I have Epomus dijani. Mm-hmm. As that so there's there's another one. I forgot what it was called, but like it was like circumspecca or something like that. And that, that that one lives in, like, Eastern Europe, but this one lives in the Middle East. Okay. So these are all really <clears throat> similar creatures, and they, they all live in this, like, little tribe of 30 different species, and they live in the same kind of area, mm-hmm. and they eat the same, same kinds of things. All right. There's some small differences. So are you ready to, to get, to get uh, a picture painted in your mind about what it looks like? All right, Bob Ross. Paint right. me a picture. So... The Beatles are blue and green and shiny. That was your Bob Ross impression? I can't even think about what he sounds like. <laughs> I know he's calm. He, he is calm. You got that part right. <laughs> I, I Honestly, I probably it's, couldn't do does it. Does it have either. a slight southern? Yeah, it does. Oh, okay. I get a little bit of thalo blow. <laughs> I just like that thalo blow. on some of that thalo white. I paint a secret bug right here. A se- <laughs> it's, it's right not, here in the corner. It's not Larry the Cable right guy. Right here in the corner. <laughs> Get her done right here in the corner. No. <laughs> this is a disservice to Bob Ross. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a way less uh, serene show to Yeah, I watch. sure would. So they, they they are blue and green and pretty pretty shiny. He's got a shiny little, what is that called? Carapace. Yeah. No, what's shininess called? Not Iridescence. Quite, not, yeah, iridescence. Yeah. It kind of looks like oil spilled on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they have a brownish brownish gold band around the rim of their... Elytra or elytra. You're about to find out what that word means. Beetles, true bugs, which I'll, I'll explain later. Stuff like uh, ladybugs, June bugs. Okay. Um, have an el- elytra, and it's that little cap on their wing, that thing that comes up and exposes their like. Oh, the real thing wing. that that one like Hercules beetle from uh, Bugs Life has. Yeah. Those big like the shell. Yeah, the the wing sheath. Okay, cool. That's called an elytra, and it, and it's called an elytron in the singular, and that sounds awesome. Okay, so elyt- elytra are both of them, and an elytron is one. Yes, that is pretty cool. It um, sounds like s- s- something out of a Stanley Kubrick movie, the elytron. Yeah, it does. It does <laughs> sound like a sci-fi word, like a, a MacGuffin in a sci-fi. <laughs> it's like we need to make sure that the. Therons don't get the elytron. <laughs> if they do, the whole universe is gone for, it's gone for. <laughs> this is me improving. <laughs> so their legs and antenna are also this yellowish orange color. The larvae are white or yellow. Uh huh. Um, this have, is why you hesitated when I said they were. They're not white. Yeah. Okay. The they have a long body with black and orange markings, and they also have very strong mandibles, which are mouth parts. Little pincers. It's very important. Little pincers. We're, we've gotten to it. I We're mean, here. there's no... Are we here? There's no getting around it at this point. Can we beat around the bush some more? We, we can't. We have to go right into it. Uh, okay, well, I'll gird my loins. Do you want to say it with me this time? Do I have to? <laughs> yeah. Uh, You're in it now. Okay. <laughs> the, it's time for the listener's most favorite part of the show. Measure up! I hate myself. <laughs> I've compromised on my morals. 100% of listeners polled actually <laughs> like the fact that you don't like it. <laughs> I, I find those statistics... Well, for this particular poll, I polled one person. I find those statistics to be warped and confusing. Well, dash statistics anyway. <laughs> um, let's talk about the beetle, the beetle, the adult beetle's um, length. So I couldn't really find weight. Uh, you can bet your bottom dollar it's a small weight. It, it weighs about as much as a bug. Yeah. But it is about 15 to 26 millimeters or 0.59 to an inch and two tenths of an inch. 1.02 okay. inches. Or I average that to be 0.8 inches. So here in this new season of ours, we quiz each other. I'm going to ask you. A question, and you're gonna give me how many beetles you think that it would take to get to this length. Okay, you're gonna give me a you're gonna give me 
a thing. A comparison. Okay. So how many beetles does it take to get to the moon? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an Archie Bunker thing. It's like I'll give you I'll give you beetles <laughs> to the moon. That's not Archie Bunker. Is it not? That's a different guy. No, it's Archie Bunker. Does he also say that? Because to the moon, Alice, that's somebody else. Are you sure? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, then I don't have my finger on the pulse of 1950s sitcoms. Jackie Gleason. Is it? Jackie Gleason on The Honeymooners. He says that. Is that a is that a show or a movie? It's a show. You really don't have your fingers on the pulse. No, 19, I don't. 1910. Archie Bunker was a really like mean and misogynistic Yeah, no, yeah, he was definitely. Though. I mean, but there was there, all of these blue collar dudes were like that. You know, these blue collar sitcom dads back in the day were gruff and grumpy and abusive. Yeah. Um all right, Until, so like Ward Cleaver was like a great dad. I'm not even Leave it to it. Beaver. Okay. <laughs> um, so are you going to muse about right. this moon situation? So, to the moon. No, the sun is 90-something million miles away. So I think the moon is less than that. All right. Man. So to the moon. <laughs> I I don't know how far the moon is away. Um, how far Or how far away the moon is. That's another way to say that. So you've got basically an inch almost. All right. How many inches to the moon? I know that it's 254 miles from here, from the surface of the Earth, to the International Space Station. Really? Mm-hmm. And I don't know how far it is from the International Space Station to the moon. It takes a couple days to get there. Um, Isn't it um, 26,000 miles to the... No, that sounds a lot. To the geosynchronous orbit for, like, satellites? I don't know. I, I all I know right. is the International Space Station... Uh, I think Orbit that's right. Distance. I think don't, don't quote me on this, but I think geosynchronous satellites, the stuff that bounces your like TV from the broadcasting station to your house is 26,000 miles away. Okay. But well, I'll I'm going to say and that's much closer than the moon. Yeah. And I I have no idea. I'm going to say 500,000 miles is the distance between here and the moon. So what's that in inches? <laughs> <laughs> and then there's what there's five there's a uh, over 5,000 feet in a mile, right? 5,400 something. For a fi- so 5,400. Really? That's 5,400 times 12. No, I have to multiply 5,400 by f- 500,000 and then I... multiply that by 12. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know, 500,000 times 1,000 is... I don't want to do this math on the... On, I'm going to say... It's definitely not... I'm, I'm going to say 52 million. I'm going to say that's how many it takes. That's a solid guess. It's wildly incorrect. (laughs) (laughs) It's probably way more. It's 18,750,000,000. Oh, my my gosh. I'm going to sit down and do the math and see how close I was just by calculating that out. Um, All right. Do you have any of these? No. Okay. Let's talk about larvae then. They're about 20 millimeters or 0.79 inches. How many larvae equal the length of a basketball court? It is the playoffs. As you know, we're getting down to the nitty gritty. Do I know? You do now. Oh, okay. Uh, how many inches? Or how, how, how long? 0.79. Point, Still, point 0.79 close inches. Close to an inch. A basketball court. Yep. Standard. Um, I'm going to say 5,600. No, now you're way too high. Uh, it's 748. Uh, <laughs> I almost said 300. That would have been closer. But I was like, man, that's way too short. 56. These, these are tough ones. The moon. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> that's unacceptable. <laughs> I should, like, I, I love space stuff. I should know how far away that is. I know that's how far hard, away the sun is. That's a hard math problem to do on the fly in a short amount of time. I could have sat down and done it based on the my estimate of 500,000 miles which but it would not have been fun to listen to no it wouldn't have all right so you want to move on to other things about it the pomus beetle all right so now as the, as one segment passes a new segment arises over the horizon from its ashes from its ashes this is the phoenix segment this is the phoenix section that only comes around like Haley's Comet. It's not every episode. It's once every 75 years. Yes. <laughs> and this segment is called Know the Difference. Of course I know how often Haley's Comet comes around, but I don't know how far away the moon is. 
Um, so adult beetles are what is known as generalist animals or generalist predators. Um, so what does this mean? I know what that means. You do? That's good. Do you want to talk about it? No, you go ahead. Okay. Generalist, a generalist species can survive in a variety of environments. Um, so that means they can have a variety of different food sources. Uh, they're typically omnivores, but they don't have to be. Um, they can withstand temperature and weather changes pretty well. Um, and they can generally adapt to environmental changes without a lot of them dying. Um, raccoons are generalists. They are generalist species because they're just as home in your trash as they are in the wood. They eat just about anything. Yeah. And they're very hardy folk. Yeah, they're hardy folk. The, <laughs> the raccoon folk. Um, they got little people hands. <laughs> they do have little people hands. Uh, uh, the opposite is a specialist species. Um, they heavily rely on specific environmental factors like temperatures, climates, and um, food sources. And food sources. And they have very few different varieties of foods they can eat. Um, many herbivores, or herbivores, as some could say, um, are specialists because they typically re- rely on a few different specific plant species to make up their diet. Okay. Um, panda bears are specialists. Super specialists. Because they eat bamboo. Now, what's interesting is that. The beetle larvae is a specialist, but the beetle adult is a generalist. Yeah. One more thing. Bugs. They're these. This is not a bug. Ants are not bugs. Uh, grasshoppers are not bugs. Bugs, technically, are a specific type of beetle. An order. Right. An order. Hepterae or something like that. Um, and they're called true bugs. And they you can tell by the way they use their walk, they're a woman's bug. No time to talk. <laughs> That's the second time you've referenced that today. Today. But the, 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 the listener doesn't know that. The, the Yeah, you're right. Hem, hemiptera. Okay, there we go. Um, and you can tell them. So they're usually round. And they have a segmented wing. And uh, examples include cicadas, aphids. Um, ladybugs, something called a leaf hopper, something called a plant hopper, something called a shield bug. Shield bug sounds cool. Yeah. So they're they're very buggy. They're, these are the quintessential bugs. But we, you can say bug if you want to when you're talking about an ant. It's, it's colloquial. just colloquial. Yeah. So are you ready? I'm ready. You ready for the major fact? I am ready for the major fact. All right, here it goes. Prepare yourself, the listener out there, for what gets my vote as the most brutal hunting style ever. And I think the most brutal animal we've covered so far, maybe the most metal, we have done an uh, animal that shoots blood out of its eyes and another one that breaks its own bones to create claws and has mutton chops. Yeah. So you may you may not agree with me on this, but I think that this one yeah, is pretty Yeah, is it metal, metal as frog? No, it's metal as bug. Well, ask the frog in this scenario. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Let's find out more. Okay, so the uh, pomus beetle goes through three stages of life. They're called instars, which are the name of these stages. Uh, so it has its larval stage. It has its, um, like, a bigger larval stage, and then it has an adult stage. Instar kind of sounds like the fake sci-fi company that makes elytrons. <laughs> it's the fake sci-fi company that when your elytron breaks down on yeah. the side of the the, <laughs> the intergalactic highway, yeah. Instar will you be press there for a you. Button. Yeah. <laughs> Each one of these stages, these instars, requires a molt. It sheds its exoskeleton, grows out of it, and then moves on. Like a lot of arthropods, I think almost all arthropods do this. It might be actually, might actually define the phylum, <laughs> um, having this exoskeleton. I saw one source that says, dur- until it gets to, as it goes through these stages, it makes a kill per stage. Which wow. Is, which is pretty crazy. I saw another one that says it kills a bunch. Because so. it needs to eat a certain amount in order to make it to the next stage. So, like, it kills, and then it eats it, and then it goes and it... Uh, Pupates or whatever it does. Yeah, it goes into the next stage, and then it kills again, and then it eats it, and goes into the next stage, and then it becomes an adult. This sounds like a great horror movie. Doesn't it? Like, you, there, somebody dies on your alien spaceship, and then all of a sudden, a new creature is on your ship, and then the twist is like, it's in its instars, different instars. All right, okay, I'm going to spoil a little bit of Alien here. Because it's why it's called the Xenomorph. Okay. Because you know how in the movie, the Xenomorph starts out as this little thing after it kills its first 
You're right. right. I just described Alien. You just did a, described Alien. <laughs> and then the next time you see it, it's a lot bigger because yeah. it's just eating someone. Or it, it doesn't eat the guy, but I still... used If this was 1970-something, I would have just written Alien. <laughs> <laughs> By accident. <laughs> yeah. All right, so... Although you wouldn't have had the wonderful, weird stylings of H.R. Geiger to, to yeah, guide you. Yeah, it would have looked like a big beetle. Yeah. It wouldn't have been good. <laughs> yeah. All right, so as a larva, the Opomus beetle is this pathetic little grub that can't hurt anyone. Right? Yeah. Least of all, me. The big, fat frog. You. Me. Yeah, you, little known fact, Carlos is a frog. I'm Mr. Toad from The Wind in the Willows. <laughs> uh-huh, he's got, he comes in in his like, little clunker car all the yeah, time. I just have crashes a, into things. I, I, I have to drive those moto cars. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so Mr. Toad has keen instincts, and he uses them. And the instinct is, if it's moving and it's smaller than me, then it's food. That's and actually, good instincts. And actually, if a frog is not attacking something that's smaller than it and moving then there's something wrong with it. So this beetle really plays on like its hardwired instincts. So uh, it uses its in- instincts to isolate the helpless larva and then uses its insanely fast tongue to strike the opomus beetle and bring or the larva and bring it into its mouth. Right. Now, that takes 0.07 seconds. It's all tongue situation, which we talked about in the Colorado River Toad episode. Yeah. But the Apomis larva isn't as helpless as it seems. The whole time, it was actually crawl. It uses this like special mandible dance yeah. almost to mimic something that uh, to like almost activate the frog's kill instinct. So you can see the small creature. You can see that it's moving and alive. But it's not just moving haphazardly. It's right, moving it's in moving a way that's little... specifically supposed to be like prey. Yeah, mouth parts. Yeah, it moves its mouth parts. So it's actually, it's waving its mandibles and its antenna to lure Mr. Toad to his doom. Um, this is called reverse predation, which is pretty, it's pretty uncommon in the animal kingdom. And it's even, uh, this is a very unique situation um, because the larva is so much smaller than its prey and it doesn't hunt in a pack. So like lions can take down an elephant, but mm-hmm. they hunt in packs. The the Apomus beetle specifically is, is by itself and lures its, lures this predator to come attack it right so when mr toad is bringing the larva to its mouth within that 0.07 second window it latches on to its it can latch on to a lot of things um but on its way in it like the the window of time for this thing to activate is crazy but on its way in it'll either bite the tongue or it'll bite like the inside of the cheek or the lip or um the inside of the gullet so th- now it looks like when you watch a video of this, which warning, these videos are pretty brutal. Um, it looks like the toads got it. It looks like it, the toad is won. Yeah. It, is, it, it gets it and it's just like the end of this larva is sticking out of its mouth and just squirming. But really the larva has now latched on to the toad. Right. Um, and I even saw a video where the frog puts his hand on the, the larva mm-hmm. and like pulls like tries to pull it off of him with his hand by pinning it against yeah, the ground. Too. And I'm like, all right, it's going to just definitely pull it off at that point. No nope. much bigger animal. Nope. It's on there. It's on there. Good. Those mandibles are sharp and strong. So the, the frog will usually freak out and try to get this thing out of its mouth because I think it feels pain, right? We talked about yeah. fish not feeling pain in their mouth, but nothing about toads. Um, so turns out, by the way, that's a very, it's a hotly contested idea. Whether or not fish can feel pain in yeah. their mouths. Yeah. Um, but so the, this, this, this larva has to be able to, like we talked about with the fly process, visual information really fast. Mm-hmm. So it can like react like this. Yeah. Well, it's like programmed to react like this. Right. Like the instant the tongue touches it, it's like kind of reaching out to grab something because the frog, obviously his tactic is to like bring something directly into his stomach almost. as fast as possible um, and then just digest the prey in there so the larva doesn't want to go into the stomach yeah, even though that's not necessarily a problem for the larva it's it's almost like these small insects god maxes out dexterity and <laughs> puts nothing into the, no. in hp or stamina although it has strength and it, yeah that's true 
So it's it, just constitution is low. So for your D and D character, it's got max dex. Yeah, it can <laughs> it can get those traps. Um, so now that the larva has latched on to some part of the uh, the frog, now we have John Hurt's character with a face hugger stuck to him. For, oh, okay. I um, thought you were going to talk about from Merlin. He's a big old John Hurt is in Merlin. Yeah, he's um that crappy BBC show. A lot of people like that show. <laughs> I didn't hey, know John Hurt was in there. It's not a bad show. <laughs> but he's the dragon. He's a dragon in that show. Okay. Does he is he does he actually play or just like no, voice he's just something? A voice of okay, yeah, that's probably why I didn't recognize him. Um in the one episode I saw. <laughs> so So John Hurt has a face hugger problem. And the larva will start excreting digestive enzymes, much like our male anglerfish situation. Mm. Except it's not trying to digest its face to something. It's digesting tissue and blood to drink it. It's a lot like how a spider uh, right. eats its prey. Um, That's an unutilized horror movie trope, I think. What, dissolving your prey and drinking it? Yeah. That sounds like a nightmare. It does sound like... <laughs> especially when it's happening slowly. Right. And it's it's not like digesting the outside of the frog. It's digesting its tissue and blood from the inside and then drinking it. Um, so John R.R. R. Toad is in trouble. <laughs> uh, after two days, y- you have a very skeletal looking toad. Mm-hmm. Because he's sucking it dry. Yeah, it looks like it's. it looks like you just sucked all the juices out of a toad. It's dead. Or right? a frog. At this point? No, it's not dead. Still alive. H.R. <clears throat> Geiger. <laughs> And then, uh, so the at this point, once it's sucked all it dry, then the larva will start using its mandibles to chew, and will start eating John from the inside out. And uh, here's the crazy part: the larva always wins this fight. Ooh. It has a 100 percent success rate. So here's why: uh, they did a test about four. They, they put they had a, a test of 400 frogs or amphibians also attack salamanders and newts um with a, a larva a pomus larva and seven times only seven times did the frog successfully get the larva into its stomach and then and then and then all seven times uh, the frog would regurgitate the larva and then the larva would just attack the frog so it would regurgitate it and it would kind of spit it out in front of it. Yeah. And then the larva would just look up and grab its face. This is like a bath salt story. <laughs> it, is like a, it is like a bath salt story. You get a fake a bath car. salt. Yeah. No, that's not really bath salt. Um, so in all 420 of these cases, the frog dies. So and the larva lives? The, yeah. The, the frogs never successfully killed a larva in 420 times so These, like they got to pass down generation to generation stories of this larva kids <laughs> but the problem mr toad needs to tell his son never go near this larva but the problem is they look like a these these the pomus beetles relatively rare and it looks like a lot of other larva so you know you could eat a larva that looks just like it and be fine so it, it's not like evolutionarily at like the adaptation part isn't selected out because it behooves them to eat all the larva that they can see. And then the few that eat an opomus beetle end up in trouble. Right. So it's not selected out. Um, so, and there was one where I saw, you can watch a video of the frog, uh, get hits a a opomus, the, the, the larva and puts it in its stomach and then you just see Epi kind of like just squirming around in its in its stomach for a while. And then it like he just can't it's not being digested like it's supposed to be. <laughs> maybe they I, I didn't read anything about like having anti digestive. Maybe it just it moves in a way that makes them nauseous and not want it in there. But still it's in there for two hours. I would think that like it would start to be digested by then. Yeah. Huh. So then it spits it out and then the beetle the, the larva kind of curled up and looked like it was dead in the frog but the frog the problem is the frog is enclosed with this be- with this larva 
And so it's kind of a cruel experiment. Yeah. Although, if you think of, of it as like feeding a, a snake a, a living mouse, then it's like you're you're feeding the the beetle, not saving the frog. Right. Because, and I don't know if you said it earlier, but oh, you said it earlier. The larva is, is a specialist. It exclusively eats frogs. Yeah. So it doesn't as in its larval stage, it has to in order to. Amphibians. In, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Amphibians. So it exclusively eats um, newts, salamanders, frogs, and toads. Right. Which toads are frogs. Um, which is crazy that the only way that it can eat is by this reverse predation. Yeah. Is by being eaten. But it only needs to eat once in that stage. Right. Yeah. So it eats once in this stage. Um, it'll hide and then molt its exoskeleton, and then it'll be in the next instar. As an adult beetle, here's where it gets even more metal. Oh, no. Um, it'll... So, <laughs> this adult beetle versus, versus this frog, the beetle will, like, kind of jujitsu its way around to the back of the frog, and then latch onto it, onto its back, and ride it like a bucking bronco. <laughs> and buck, it does. Uh, the frog usually loses its marbles and starts to flail around the enclosure trying to get this beetle off of it. I don't know, maybe sometimes it lands it like lands backwards and crushes the beetle, but it seems like a pretty hardy beetle. Yeah. So it like after all of this fr- frantic flailing, um, the beetle is usually still on. Then once there's like a lull in the flailing, it'll use its mandibles to cut. They're still not sure exactly what it cuts. Um, they think it's maybe a nerve, um, or a tendon, or actual muscle, uh, which over the course of a few minutes will completely paralyze the amphibian. My goodness. So, they, but they notice it doesn't cut through the spine, so it's probably cutting its leg muscles so that it can't move anymore. Which is pretty much, if you can't hop, you ain't even a frog anymore. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's kind of, it's, it's his identity. Yeah. If I can't hop, what have I got? The front arms aren't really meant for dragging themselves along, so they end up having to stay in one place once their back legs don't work anymore. So then, the Pomus beetle, the adult one, can enjoy slowly digesting this frog at its leisure. This is a nightmare. Yep. I- I'm angry at this beetle. <laughs> It's, it is really rude. Yeah, right? <laughs> Kill it, you know? I know, yeah. Like, go for the throat. Well, sometimes they do go for the throat when they're the larva stage. Yeah, but they don't kill it. it like, it's it, not enough. No matter what, it takes a long time for this frog to die. Yeah. And when it has the larva stuck to its face, it'll usually just, like, kind of go around and be a frog. Go, like, eat other things and whatever and just have to deal with this big thing sticking out of its mouth. And then it'll slowly get weaker and weaker and weaker. And then it eventually won't be able to move anymore because it'll be so weak. And then it just starts to chomp down until it's nothing but bones after a couple days. Insane. Like, this is v- such a highly, like, designed and specialized mode of killing. Yeah. It's one kind of creature. And not... And it's so much smaller and it seems like such a prey situation. But really, the frog is the prey. Yeah. And that's crazy. But, yeah, that's all I've got. And I think we're way over. I think that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So Nightmare fuel. In, in my, nightmare fuel. Uh, sorry for that super brutal thing, but this is a very interesting animal. And so for the listener, saddle up, latch on, and slowly drain your prey's life force like the perfect organism in life, death, and taxonomy. Hey everyone, Carlos here. We like to think of our podcast as a series of public service announcements. For those Middle Eastern frogs out there, now you know what to watch out for to avoid a slow and humiliating death at the hands of your prey. This PSA is supported in part by viewers like you. No, we're not asking for money yet, but we could definitely use some of those sweet, sweet subscriptions and reviews. It doesn't matter whether you use Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or some other podcast app. Everyone can do their part to help treat the illness of ignorance among our amphibious brethren. Thanks for listening, and remember to tell everyone you know about our show. This podcast is brought to you in part by the Brain Trust Brothers Network. For more information about this podcast or others, visit braintrustbros.com.
Yeah. Like, hey there, Delilah, it's your old ex-boyfriend. <laughs> thought lifting weights and working out was what made me so buff and handsome, but you're wrong. <laughs> it's because I let my hair here. grow long. It makes me strong. <laughs> I'm putting this at the end. And he goes, <laughs> oh, I'm a Nazarene. <laughs> Although he's not, he's a Nazarite. Jesus yeah. was a Nazarene. Yeah. <laughs> Tim, Tim Hawkins. Hawkins. <laughs> <laughs>